Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath a todos. Bienvenidos. Welcome, everybody. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're looking forward to praising and worshiping God together. Amen. Amen. Gracias por estar aquí esta mañana. Este, vamos a alabar y a adorar a nuestro Dios. Amen. Amen. Alabemos. Vamos a los palmas.
We know that no matter how much our effort might be, how much strength, how loud we can sing, Lord, they are nothing but shortcomings. And even so, Lord, they may be, we still choose to freely give it to you, Lord. Although you are worthy of so much more that we are not capable of imagining or fathoming. Father, we are still here this day to humble ourselves before your throne and before your presence. And to confess that it's because your blood that we are here this morning. It's because of what you have already done in our lives and in history that we have the blessing to be here before you this day as one church, as one body. Lord, we draw close to you this day. May this day you bless us with your word, with your teaching, with your knowledge. Lord, we ask a blessing for the kids, we ask a blessing for the youth, we ask a blessing for all the elders here, all the adults, Father, that your word may be imparted upon our hearts this morning. And we ask you to keep building our minds, our souls, and our hearts so that your kingdom can shine through us and your kingdom can touch others, Lord. Receive this day all the praise, all the worship, all the honor, all the glory, all the love, all the reverence. Father, receive everything that we can and everything that we will give to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, the young adults are going to stay here. Who do you want to uh, have the message for? They didn't want me to, so it's fine, it's fine. Uh, so what we're going to do, because they didn't want me to, they want to thank uh, the Seventh-day Baptist Christian Church, because today they're going to be the last one to eat. Amen. Amen. Even when I know that the food is good, it's good, tips are not going to be allowed, okay? And, and the only tip that we're going to take is a hug, okay? So, and, and yeah, uh, so we have today Pastor Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, this is your house. We are your people. And you have a word for us today. And my prayer is that you will use my heart, my lips, my mind to convey your message. So Father, we ask you to bless us. Watch over us as we are here. Thank you for this day. We give you the honor and the glory and the praise and we do it in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Please be seated. surgery, my church had let me preach for five weeks. I was afraid I'd forget how. But they said, no, not a problem. We don't think that you will forget. During that time that I was uh, out of the fault of the Lord, gave me an opportunity to do a lot of reading and a lot of meditating, a lot of praying. I got a hold of a, of a challenging book and one of our young pastors from West Virginia put on Facebook, you know, you really ought to read this book because it's challenging. And so I ordered it. And I read it and I talked with our director of pastoral services this week. And he said, I saw you got the book. And I said, yeah, and I hate it because it's challenging. It really is. And the thing that happened was I've only gotten through the first chapter. And I've read the first chapter now five times. Be 
Because what it does, it challenges the way that I grew up, the way that I began ministry. It challenged me about my whole concept of who God is. And I don't know about you, but I want to know what God is doing in this world today. I don't believe that he's sleeping. I don't believe that he's taking a break or whatever. I believe that God is at work. And that there are undercurrents, not just here in the United States, but around the world there's an undercurrent. There's a new day coming for Christians. Amen. Now the thing that happens is that there are a lot of things going on in our world today that challenge that. So I wrote some things down that I want you to contemplate with me. Not only do I like to know what God is doing in the world today, I like to know, to understand what God said in the past, in the Old Testament. And if there is anything in there that I can grab a hold of, that I can put into practice in my own life. I want to know if what was given in the past is applicable to today. I want to know the truth. This is what I wrote down. Because no matter what, truth is the thing that we need. Truth is the only thing that will save us. A lie cannot save us. Neither will a distortion of the truth save us. The truth. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's what the Bible says. So I wrote these things down. Noah's message from the steps going up into the ark, and you all know the story, right? Was not something good is going to happen to you. Okay? Amos did not confront the high priest of Israel proclaiming confession is possession. Jeremiah was not thrown into the pit for preaching I'm okay, you're okay. Daniel was not thrown into the lion's den for telling people positive thinking will move on. Huh? John the Baptist was not forced to preach in the wilderness and eventually beheaded because he preached, smile, God loves you. The two prophets in the tribulation we're not killed for preaching. God is in heaven and all is right to the world. I want to know what the truth is. Because you see, it's only the truth that will make a difference. An eternal difference. Why is it that we refuse to accept the truth? We talked about that in Sabbath school this morning. Throughout the Bible, we are told, actually all of these prophets, their message was very simple. Repent. Turn away from sin. Turn toward God. I think it's a message that this world needs to hear today. Now this doesn't affect you in, in Virginia or in Washington, D.C., but in November, just a, a few weeks away, we in Maryland get to decide whether or not our state recognizes same-sex marriage. Now, we have choice in Maryland. And this, by the way, is something that Christians have said to me. Well, it's predicted in the Bible that things are going to go from worse to worse. Okay? And there really isn't anything that we can do about it. After all, with all of these mega churches around us, what can we do? We are so small. I wrote this down. You can write it down because this is good stuff. All right? Being small does not relieve us of the responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Just because we're only 20, 30, 40 people? Just because together all of us here are only 100 or 125 or 130 people? 
And we've got churches that have 600 people, 800 people, 1,000 people out there. Does not relieve us of the responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Matthew 3, 1 and 2 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. John the Baptist was the forerunner who prepared the way for the coming of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came on the scene, he said, Here is the one, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And you know what? We either accept the truth or we deny the truth. And if we accept the truth, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through Him, you and I have a responsibility to share that fact, that truth, with those around us. So I said to Central, and I want you to pray for us. Because in November we have the opportunity to, to vote in Maryland whether or not our state will, be, will accept same-sex marriage. In our church we have adopted a a paper that says we do not believe in same-sex marriage for this reason, scriptural. The Lord has been laying on my heart that what we need to do is not just simply say, yes, this is what we believe, but that we must go out to where the polling places are and be willing to hand these things out, not badger people, not to strong arm them, but to give them the truth. Amen. See? And that's what it's about. So it doesn't make any difference how many we are. It doesn't matter how many PhDs or how many titles we have before or after our name. The call is clear that we are to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And you know what? It is true. Not because the Bible says so, but the way that those who proclaimed it live. Those people who proclaimed the word of God, even in the Old Testament, and died and were willing to die. And those in the New Testament who believed in Jesus Christ and who gave up their lives to spread the good news. You see, to me, that's the convincing part. You can't have so many people believing a lie and getting away with it and to have that word preserved. But it has been preserved. And so I'm one of those people. I want to know what God is doing today. I want to know what God did in the past. The last couple of weeks in our nation has been... Interesting. We had the celebration of 9-11. I remember where I was. I remember all the details of 9-11. On 9-11, we had our embassy in Libya attacked. By the way, we were told that we would be attacked. Our ambassador was killed along with three other Americans. There are protests all over, around the world. Mm -hmm. They're trying to tell us that it's a, the reason that all that is happening is a 45 minute video on the internet. I want to know what the truth is. Okay. See, this is what I know, I know to be the truth. Satan is alive in the and he's coming against God's people. That's right. So you and I need to be aware. So I would like for you to turn to Ezekiel 33. I've only got 47 pages to go through. <laughs> Ezekiel 33. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, that first verse to me is a whole sermon in itself. 
The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to who? Ezekiel. Ezekiel had a relationship with God and was able to hear what God was saying to him. Now, not only was he able to hear, but he was able to know that it was God who was speaking. And you know what? I This is what I believe. I believe that the majority of Christians today have no idea what the voice of God sounds like. Because they're not in His Word. It is evident by the great divide that is in the church today. And if you're not going to hear the Word of God through His Word, the Bible, then you're not going to be able to hear it anyplace else. Because this is the key. So, this is what happens. All through the Old Testament, I read about these people. The Word of the Lord came to be saying. The Word of the Lord came to Jonah. The Word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. The Word of the Lord came to Amos. The Word of the Lord came to, to Daniel. The word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came. And they knew that it was God. And I want us to know God that intimately that when God speaks, we're able to know the voice of God. However it comes to us. Whether it is through His word or whether the sky opens up and His voice says, Listen. I want us to be able to know that it is God. The word of the Lord came to be saying. And when this happens in the Old Testament, it's not, you know, really a very good message. You know, the message comes and it's one that challenges. It's one that says, hey, I have this against you. Son of man. Verse 2. Speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land, and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon this land, and blows on the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would have delivered his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes against them and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you, on your part, warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. Now, I could go on, but boy, there's enough there for us, is it not? I mean, isn't this a challenge to us? It should be. Because we've had so many things happen in this world. And, you know, there are those who are proclaiming, as they have proclaimed in the past, that the end times are here. That it can't be too long before the Lord comes. The people of Jesus' day thought exactly the same thing. Well, when are you going to come back? And in Matthew 24, he says... You know, there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be pestilence. There will be earthquakes in diverse places, various places. And haven't we seen that in our day and age? See, Satan is always at work. Satan is always working to undermine the people of God and the message of God. 
Why is it that today we have churches that embrace homosexuality, that which God calls an abomination? We've got churches that are embracing same-sex marriage. You know, I had a person say to me, Pastor Dave, you know, do you believe, don't you believe that they have the same rights as we do? And I said, you know what, we're not talking about rights. We're talking about the Word of God. We're talking about what God says, not what man says, not what the legislature says. We're talking about what God says. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what we need to do is we need to go back and we need to understand what it is that God is saying. Why is it that God has been taken out of our schools? That they can't even pray at commencement anymore? Why is that? Because, church, we have not been the watchman. And we have not said, you know, thus saith the Lord. So I want to give three things to you today that I glean from this chapter. In order to be a watchman, and by the way, God is calling us to be watchmen. Amen. God is calling you and me. He's calling our individual churches to be watchmen. And it doesn't matter if there are these mega churches with a thousand people or so who don't believe the same thing that we do. We stand on the truth. We stand on the truth of the word of God. Amen? Amen? I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. First to the Jew, then to the Greeks. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ set the standard. God set the standard. Man did not. So what we have to do is we have to open our eyes. And we have to watch. Three things. Number one, you've got to see. You've got to see what's happening out in the world today. You've got to understand what is going on. As uncomfortable as it may be. As challenging as, as it may be. There are those things that are happening in our world that challenge the way I do things. The way that I think. The way that I believe. Amen? But you know what? Truth is truth. And I want to know what the truth is. Because only the truth will set us free. So I have to be ready and willing and able to see. And I can't see if my life is clouded with sin. If I don't have a good vertical relationship with God, I'm not going to be able to see what's happening in the horizontal. So I want to know what God is doing. And so therefore, I'm going to have to read these challenging books. I'm going to have to be challenged about the way not only I do things, but the way the church does things. The second thing is we need to be ready to speak. Now that can be an uncomfortable thing, and it was uncomfortable for the Old Testament prophets. Can't you just see, you know, Ezekiel or Jeremiah going, oh, the Lord's going to kill you. You know, oh, I'm happy. You know, the word that he gave to these prophets was not always the best. You know, when they heard it, it was a terrible word. And it was a word to the point where they even wanted to kill the prophet. <coughs> we don't want to hear it. We do the same thing today. Truth comes. Somebody will come and speak a truth, a word, and will reject it and say, oh, that's just fantasy. That's just fable. And why do we do that? Because it challenges us to speak. To speak the Word of God. To speak about Jesus Christ. You know, we sang all kinds of choruses today. Yeah. 
His love endures forever. What about all the people who are outside who don't know the love of God? That don't know about Jesus Christ. Well, they'll never listen to us anyway. Well, why don't you invite them to come to church? Oh, they'd never come to our church. We don't have a choir. We don't have a pianist. We didn't. You know, whatever. We don't have Sabbath school classes for them. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can come up with all kinds of excuses, can't we? Well, I've invited them 40 times, and they haven't accepted. So I'm not going to invite them anymore. You and I must be able to see what God is doing. See, that's what God told the prophet here, right? He says, when the watchman sees. That means that the watchman has to be willing to see. Has to be willing to look at what's happening. Has to be willing to know what God is doing. And to know the difference and be able to discern against that which God is doing and that which Satan is doing. Amen. And what we've got right now is we've got a church that is confused. Because they don't know who is speaking. They don't know whether God is speaking or whether it's Satan. Because Satan has a way of making things sound good. Sound good. But in the end, we'll bring about destruction. We have to be able to see that. We have to be able to. And it takes time. It takes energy. It takes a willing heart to, be, to put other things aside and look at the things that are going on around us. So that we can discern. But then we must be willing to speak. We must be willing not to, you know, it's really neat. We can come in our own little church gatherings and, you know, isn't that cool? I mean, we worship well, don't we? Amen? That's a whole different thing when we're out there all alone and we're at work. Or we're with our friends sitting at Panera Bread having a pumpkin pie muffin <laughs> and coffee. Somebody will say something and we don't speak. So we have to be willing to see. We have to be willing to speak. The third thing is simply seeking to do the Lord's will above all else. What is it that, that drives us? What is it that motivates us? Is it money, power, prestige? Our families? Or is it that the Lord might be glorified in what we do and say and how we live? Am I willing to see what the Lord is doing today and what He is speaking to me, to the church today? Am I willing to speak those words? Am I willing to stand out at that polling place and hand out this piece of paper and say, I encourage you to vote against Resolution 6? Knowing that there might be those who are going to curse and maybe even spit at me. Am I willing to do that? Yes. I'm willing to do that. Am I willing to speak when the word might not be so good? Or do I seek to do the Lord's will more than anything else in my life? So that I might be on that day that I stand before Him to hear those words, well done good and faithful servant. Let's go on. Ezekiel 33, starting at verse 10. Now as for you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have spoken, saying, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How then can we survive? 
Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? And you, son of man, say to your fellow citizens, the righteousness of a righteous man will not deliver him in the day of his transgression. And as for the wickedness of the wicked, he will not stumble because of it in the day when he turns from his wickedness. Whereas a righteous man will not be able to live by his righteousness on the day when he commits sin. There has to come a time, my brothers and sisters, when sin becomes so abhorrent to us that we're able to see what sin is doing to our country and to this world. We must be willing to see that. And then we must be willing to speak. We must be willing to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, Repent, for the kingdom of God is in hand. And we need to seek to do His will above all else. Regardless of what other churches do, regardless of what people around you do, regardless of who says what, regardless of what the legislature in Washington, D.C., or in Richmond, Virginia, or in Annapolis, Maryland, say, we need to speak the truth. I want to know the truth. Don't you? Aren't you tired? I mean, if you listen to television and you listen to the political debates that are going on and all these things, who's telling the truth? You know? Who's lying? What's it all about? I want to know the truth. You know what? I do not have within me the capacity to know what is truth. But my God does. Amen. And so what we need to be is we need to be so in touch with God that we will, when He speaks, we will know His voice. And we will be able to respond. And we will be able to reject all the other voices that come our way. That says, oh, believe this, believe that. That's why we're in such terrible straits today. That's why people are, are leaving the church. They say the church doesn't know what it believes. You got one part of the church that says this is truth. Another part said, no, that's a lie, but this is truth. What is truth? Truth is this, my brothers and sisters. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And one man comes to the Father through me. I don't know what else you do. The only thing that you can do with it is reject it if you don't believe it. Say, and the thing of it is that everybody in this room, and a lot of other people, by the way, have heard me state that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. So if people reject that, their blood is upon their head. Amen? Amen. But if we refuse to speak, if we refuse to see, if we refuse to seek to do the will of God, and we don't sound the alarm, guess what? Their blood is on our head. Thus says the Lord. That's what he says. So I encourage you today to be watchmen. To know what it is that's happening in our world today. To see God's hand where God's hand is. But then to reject the places that claim to have God's hand but don't. How am I going to do that, Pastor? I'm going to put it against the Word. From the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of the Revelation. If it isn't in there, I'm not going to believe it. Say, any other way. They will tell you you can get to nirvana by 
you know, what is it, transcendental meditation. No, you get to heaven by Jesus Christ. <laughs> Isn't it strange? So God has called us to be watching. Whether we're a church or individual Christians, we bear a responsibility to be watching. Let's pray. Being a watchman of God is scary. We have to be on guard all the time. We have to be able to see what's happening at all times. We must not grow weary. We must not faint. We must not sleep. We must have clear vision, not clouded by the things of the world, but solely based upon your word. We need to seek to do your will. We need to have that personal relationship with you so that each one of us knows what we're called to do within the body of Christ so that we can effectively, effectively be a good witness for you. Being small does not relieve us of the responsibility. So today, Father, as we're gathered here, and as we have every day of our lives, the opportunity to respond to the things that are around us, the question will be, how will we respond? Will we continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Or will we fall back? Because, after all, the Bible says that it's going to get worse and worse. Well, they won't listen to us anyway. Or will we proclaim with a loud voice, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jew, then to the Greek, and then to all those who believe. We have that message. We're called to be watchmen. So when you leave this place today, do so with open eyes and open heart and open spirit. And see what God is doing in our world today. And what he's calling us to do in his world.